Okay. All right. Let's begin. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm very sorry for uh, for my lateness. Uh, no good excuse. So let's get started. Uh, today's class is uh, is on the Haggadah, Haggadah Insights. It's a very fun class to prepare for. I hope um, hope it's as inspirational for you as it has been for me to find new insights. Every year, uh, many of us try to find new things to say at the Seder. Uh, sometimes it's the same thing. We just, just we we just forgot we forgot that we've said it before. And sometimes these are new insights, uh, just uh, new perspectives, a different, uh, different, you know, different, uh, little different detail you might have never noticed before. And here and now, you have the opportunity to uh, to think of something you didn't think about before. So, in uh, in preparation for for this class, um, I had uh, the uh, really three sources. Um, really uh are, have uh, are going to color my seder this year uh there's a lot going on in the world obviously as uh, you know usually this time of the year there's a lot going on in Eretz Israel right now as you know there's uh, there's there's war going on in in Europe and uh not just Europe but uh you know where, where I'm from so uh so obviously uh, that's on my mind but uh but I think the, the recent passing of Chaim Kanievsky is uh, definitely um, creating a huge impact in, um, in in the Torah world for sure, and so uh, I'd like to bring some of that bring some of that home uh, with with some insights of his in, uh, into the into the Exodus story, which is what uh, which is what the Seder night is supposed to be about. Uh, another thing that's going to um, strongly influenced my seder this year is uh, this book that I had the privilege to review for the Jewish press called uh, Haggadah for the Curious Three. And uh, there's a volume one and a volume two, obviously. This is volume three. It's by Rabbi A. Levin. I had the opportunity to, uh, to you know, contact the author, uh, speak a little bit with him. Uh, to sort of get an idea of what he's trying to do. Very important work he's working on, I think, and uh, some interesting insights I'd like to share from there. And third, uh, but not least, uh, is an unexpected source. Um, uh, you know, every, uh, almost every holiday recently, um, Robert and Claire Siegel uh, have a friend in, uh, in Colorado, by the name of Rabbi Levi Lebovitz, uh, or Lebovitz, I'm not really sure how to pronounce the last name. Anyway, he uh, he works over there with, uh, I believe, the Aish um, in uh, in Denver, and uh, the Vaad Project. And every year, he uh, almost every holiday, really, almost almost major holiday, he he publishes something about the Shuva for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and uh, and this year for the Haggadah. Uh, the, he published a work called Your Story, Your Mission, which we have free in the Shul foyer, several copies. And I you know, just want to look through it to see, uh, to see if it, there's anything nice in there. There's a lot nice in there. This, it's, just, it's, a, it's an amazing, very easy, simple work. Uh, and I strongly recommend just, just looking through it. It's a very, um, uh, when we get to it, we get to it. But uh, anyway, those are the three sources that we uh, that we're going to have for for the, for to help us get through the seder this year and hopefully like i said it inspired me so maybe uh, some of these ideas might also inspire you so for example for example let's uh, let's go to the haggadah for the curious 3 so the way that this work um, is laid out is it's questions and answers and these aren't necessarily questions that you would expect. They're not questions like, uh, you know, uh, how long should the matzah be in the oven? You know, the basic, you know, Passover type questions, but uh, questions that you wouldn't expect. So like, for example, which garment has very little concern for shotness? So what's shotness? So shotness, as we're learning in the Mishnayot of Kilayim, shotness is a forbidden mixture 
uh, of uh, linen and wool. Linen and wool should not be uh, should not be um, worn in the same clothing together. And so the uh, the question is, which garment has little concern for shatnas? Obviously, clothing if it's if it's clothing should be a concern. So he says here. He quotes from a work called Pardes Yosef HaChadash that it is very unlikely that one's kittel contains shotness. What's a kittel? Okay, so a kittel is uh, the white robe type garment usually worn by men on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur and also usually worn at the Pesach Seder and usually worn, that's right, or something like it is worn um, after 120 years, uh, in uh, in the Aron, in the uh, in, in the casket, uh, that that is what a person uh, that is what a man wears. We'll get more into that uh, in in the weeks after uh, Pesach when we start learning again about the Jewish life cycle class. So again, so it is very unlikely that one's kittel contains shatnas, as a kittel is usually made from just one type of fabric. Shatnas requires obviously a combination of wool and linen. Uh, the uh, the kittel is usually made from one thing. On this holy night, which is Pesach, right? One needs to be particularly careful not to wear clothes that contain shotness. And for this reason, that's one of the reasons he says that there's a custom to wear a kittel. Right? We said there's a custom, a court, definitely a custom amongst Ashkenazi men to wear a kittel at the Pesach Seder. And so that is one of the reasons to do that. A reason you wouldn't have thought of, right? So again, the question totally uh, from left field has nothing to do with Pesach, seems like. And the answer brings us back to what are we doing tonight? We're wearing a kittel. Why are we wearing a kittel? It's because one of the reasons is because it's a special holy night. We're doing it. It's not just a, a fancy meal. It's not just an excuse to eat brisket. Uh, the Seder is an important, um, for lack of a better word, it's an important ritual. It's something that we're doing. It's 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 a process, and we've talked about this uh, in last year's um, class on this topic. Uh, I, I I tried to give over uh, Rabbi David Orlovsky's famous uh, idea of why we sing. You know the uh, what what why it's his only it's it's not originally his I think, but anyway the why why it is that we sing the steps of the seder when we when we start and one of the reasons he gives is because we have to remember that there's a goal in mind we want to go through all of the steps that lead to the final destination and the final destination is not just to bench and uh, you know go to sleep as soon as possible there's there's a barich, a halel, and then there's nirza. Nirza is really the goal of the seder. You're supposed to get to the point where you're so enthusiastic about your Judaism, so happy that uh, whatever you've accomplished, and we'll get to what it, what it is that we're trying to accomplish in the seder. But once you've accomplished this, you're supposed to be so happy. You're supposed to jump for joy and sing songs. You know, chagadia is not uh, it's not just a, not such a simple thing. So. Um, so, uh, this, this book, uh, again, so the, uh, the idea behind, um, uh, the Haggadah for the Curious is that, uh, the author feels, and I, I, I can't help but agree that, uh, people are often, um, sort of set in the sort of mode where they're on autopilot. And even though we might we might be naturally curious, we don't usually ask questions. And when we don't ask questions, we don't think. And so we go through the Seder sort of thoughtlessly. And so a book like this brings up questions that you didn't think of. You start thinking about them and, you know, you, you get to uh, appreciate more what it is we're going through. Um, there's... Um, Interesting question, uh, very relevant to this year, right? Which wine should not be used for the second cup? There are four cups of wine. One cup should not be, one, one type of wine should not be used for the second cup of these four. Why? Shemitah wine, wine that's, that was made from grapes grown this year, in a year like this, or seven, I guess seven years ago, 
right? 14 years ago. Shemitah wine. The reason is that we pour some of the wine out of the second cup when we get to the 10 plagues. When we get to the 10 plagues, you use your pinky or you pour it out, whatever it is you do, different customs. But when you're going to get to the plagues and you're going to be pouring out the wine, really not drinking it, you're not benefiting from it. And Shemitah wine cannot be wasted. It can't be, it, uh, it, it needs to be drunk. In the, in the Shemitah year, when, uh, when if, if you're obviously, if you're not, uh, if you're not uh, you know, using it illegally, right? in other words, uh, nobody bought it or sold it, you, uh, you, you acquired it on your own, um, then you can, uh, you can drink it, but you cannot use it, you can't just waste it. And so, because you can't waste it, you can't pour out this, uh, so this is, you see how, just a random question, like, what kind of wine should you not use for the second cup? And like, I don't know, what kind of wines are there? Merlot, maybe uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, whatever it is. So uh, Cabernet. So the, it doesn't. Uh, it, it's uh, it brings up interesting questions that you might not have thought of. Here's an interesting question, um, and we talked about this in the uh, in the Seder class last week. Uh, there are different customs regarding what to use for carpas. So here's a question for you about carpas. What did the Chavetz Chaim use for Karpas? What did Rav Chaim Kanievsky use for Karpas? So it, it might be uh, might be a surprise to you to learn that both of them used potato. Uh, obviously, as we learned in the potato class many uh, many months ago, the potato is relatively new to uh, to Europe, five hundred years. So uh, so obviously before that they did not use potatoes. But uh, the uh, the interesting thing here is he, he he quotes here from the Vayagid Moshe that some people do not use onion or radish for karpas as it can cause bad breath. And tonight, when we use our mouths to relate Hashem's praises, it is proper to do so with fresh breath. Right? Uh, there are different minhagim to use cabbage, cucumbers, tomatoes, uh, any vegetable, any hadama can be used for karpas. The important thing is to use whatever it is that you're accustomed to use and uh there's um it's uh, commonly celery um and whatever it is it should be dipped in salt water we you know that um and you have to of course uh when you the the custom is to have in mind for the, when you say the hadama you're having in mind also the maror that you're going to eat much later after the magid. Now that's at least a reason to uh, to to wonder why you would want to do such a thing. After all, you do make hamotzi and eat the matzah before you get to the maror, and uh, and perhaps part of the answer might be that the maror isn't really part of the meal. Now, obviously, it's part of the seder. Don't get me wrong. But is it part of what you're about to eat? Is it, is it the food you're enjoying? And in theory, in theory, the maror is supposed to be something you're not really enjoying. It's supposed to be very bitter, uh, as, uh, as romaine lettuce uh, perhaps used to be. Or almost definitely used to be. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, it gets to the magid. And, uh, and he uh, has some very interesting questions there. Interesting answers also. For example, um, he says, um, how do we show, and this is very relevant to the, to the Seder, how do we show that we used to be at the lowest level and then Hashem raised us up? Now we know uh, we uh, there's uh, lots of... Uh, uh, lots written about this that the Jewish people were very, very sunken down to in terms of in terms of uh, yeah, psychologically, in terms of spiritually, we were not uh, we were not holding in a very high level at the time of of the Egyptian exile, and we were actually almost gone. If Hashem would have waited any longer, we would have it would have been too late. So when Hashem re less, uh, when Hashem took us out at that point. He actually uh, brought us up. He, he raised our level. So much so that 50 days later, we were able to have a Shavuot. 
we were able to receive the Torah at Mount Sinai, which is a, an amazing difference between, you know, almost being so low that we uh, aren't worthy of leaving Egypt to being on a level of receiving the Torah. So that, that rising up is symbolized at the Seder by us lifting up there's a, the, the, the kara, the plate, when we say the halach ma'anya, at the very beginning of Magid. This is the bread of our affliction. We lift up the, the plate. And uh, so the Chaim Larur says that that's what we do it when we, when we uh, lift up that plate. The Chida brings, it used to be the custom in some families that every member of the family uh, or every man and boy would join together in lifting up the plate to, uh, to shoulder height. I'm assuming they have the same shoulder height uh, or thereabouts. And so that's, uh, that's an interesting thing. Now, he, uh, he also brings, uh, some of us like gematria, uh, he also brings that the gematria of Lachma Anya is 250. So the uh, uh, bread of poverty is, two, uh, did I say 250? 210, 210, which is the same number of years that the Jews were slaves in Egypt, according to the Birkat Hashir. So we have this beautiful idea. So we have this correspondence of our poverty is has been raised up, and uh, and that's how that's one of the reasons why we lift up the plate at that point. This definitely something you can mention when you're when you're about to do it at the seder. You, you're reading the instructions, right, whatever Haggadah you're using, and it says lift up the plate. So that's your chance. That's your opportunity to tell your guests, oh, why are we about to lift up our plates? Right? Ask the question and then uh, see if they know anything about the gematria of uh, Lachma Anya. All right, beautiful. Um, uh, okay, this is worth this is worth saying. Uh, we uh, we have the the four sons, and the four sons ask various questions or in the case of the one who can't ask, don't ask a question, right? But the Rasha Omer, Mahu, Mahu Omer, what, is the, what does the, the evil son say, or the wicked one say? What is this thing you're doing? What is this avoda of yours? So in response, we're supposed to, because he has excluded himself from the congregation, what is it for you, not for me? So because he speaks in such a way, so uh, you're supposed to hake et shinav, supposed to blunt his teeth. Hake means to sort of the opposite of sharpen, right? You're supposed to blunt his teeth, uh, which uh, needs explanation. What does that mean? Is that like, is that a method of parenting that's, you know, maybe perhaps worked over the years? You know, oh, you said something I don't like, so I'm going to blunt your teeth. So what's, what's going on? So... Uh, so it's probably not a very effective uh, method of parenting uh, in the simple explanation. So let's see what else it might mean. The uh, Rav Michal Ber, uh, Michal Ber Weismandl is quoted here in this uh, Haggad of the Curious Three. He says that the Russia craves modernity in his life and he can't tolerate that we're still bound by Torah and mitzvot, right? In general, when there's been wickedness amongst... Okay. Uh, in general, when there's been wickedness amongst the Jewish people, individuals, etc., usually uh, the, the, the problem has been caused by a desire to escape, escape, quote unquote, orthodoxy, uh, to escape the old fashioned thing and do something new, right? Uh, you know, blaze your own path, etc. Uh, but uh, I mean, obviously, there's, there's a great irony in all that. Uh, I've, I've pointed out uh, to, to several people, and that is that uh, Judaism is the attack on orthodoxy. In other words, what was orthodox before Avraham is idol worship. Everybody did it. You know, that's what that, that was the right thing to do. And his trailblazing, his his idea of monotheism and kindness and understanding God's role in our lives. All of that was unique and and totally out of uh, out of the box, and uh, and so you know he was the opposite of conventional, 
So he's the rebel. So if you want to be rebellious, be like him. Don't go back to what was before Avraham. So, uh, so uh, aside from all that, so he, uh, Rav, uh, Rav Mois Mandels writes, the, the, the Russia would want us to follow the times and discard the ancient traditions transmitted to us throughout the generations from Harsinai. We therefore ask the Russia, why not take out your own outdated teeth and put in fake gold or silver teeth that are much nicer? So it's kind of like a, a sort of, uh, we're, we're challenging them, right? That's what it means, hake et shinav. And ask them, uh, what about your teeth? You don't like the old? You don't like the outdated? You don't like what we've always done? You want to do things your own way? So take out your teeth and put in new ones. Obviously, you're not serious, right? This is a, this is a rhetorical device. Right? We know you've never chosen to do, uh, you'd never choose to do that, obviously, because the teeth God gave you are far superior. In the same way, you should know that our sacred traditions that have been handed down through gener generations are far better for you, both physically and spiritually, I would add emotionally, psychologically, uh, than going with the secular winds of the time. So uh, this is uh, just another great quotation and idea from the Haggadah for the Curious. And almost every page has uh, beautiful insights Definitely worth uh, worth checking out if you have the opportunity. You still have time. You still have several shopping days before uh, Pesach. Um, don't know how fast the shipping was going to be. That's another question. All right. So, but what's much easier for you to acquire, uh, at least for this year, is uh, is this uh, booklet from Rabbi Levi Lebowitz. 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 Uh, either way. Um, so. Very well written, um, and what I, what I want to say about it before much else is that it's more than anything else, it's consistent. It has a theme, like a good essay. It has a theme, and every single thing that is written in the rest uh, before, you know, in, in these pages, every single idea in these pages goes back to that theme. Okay, so let's, uh, with no further ado, let's talk about what the theme is. The theme is also in the title. The title says, your story, your mission. The Haggadah is a mission. The Haggadah tells you what the point is of Judaism. And Judaism has a mission, has a goal. And the entire Seder experience is supposed to cause you, give you the opportunity to take away something, to gain something. What did you gain at the end of the Seder? Brisket? Uh, what, what was the goal? So again, just like we said before about Nirza, that that's the goal. Why? Why is that the, why, what, what, what are you so happy about when you get to Nirza? How are you going to get there? So it helps to know what the theme is. It helps to know what the consistent theme throughout the Haggadah is. And throughout the Haggadah, according to this book, and we're going to see some examples, I hope, is that it tells us what the life mission of a Jew is. The life mission of a Jew is, according to this book, and according to many others, I should, I should add, that, uh, that, that there is a, is teach the world that there is a God, and that God cares about us. It's an important mission. And, and the entire, um, really, theme of the Haggadah points to that as well. It's not just, Yitziat Mitzrayim is not just, as he says here, it's not just a story of how our ancient forefathers gained freedom from Egypt. It's the story of the birth of the Jewish people as a nation. It tells us the purpose for our creation. It tells us about Hashem's plan for helping us achieve that purpose. And it gives us marching orders so we can actually go ahead and achieve it. These marching orders apply to every single member of the Jewish people, including you. In other words, this Haggadah is supposed to give a is, is supposed to give an individual personal message to each of us. It's a theme I've been talking about quite often. Some uh, some people uh, might say I, I speak about it too much, but I, I think it's, it's something we really need to hammer home. Is that Judaism isn't about what the community thinks about you. It's not about 
uh, you know, doing what your parents did. Judaism is not about, you know, uh, re somehow reflecting some other Jewish identity you might have seen on TV. Judaism is about your personal relationship with Hashem that cannot be done by anybody else and, and any other time. It's you. Only you can do it. And you, you're, you, the reason you're alive in this world, right? Because not everybody is. The reason you're alive in this world right now is so that you will be able to achieve what only you can achieve. And the Haggadah's theme is throughout the entire Haggadah. This book goes on. The entire theme is that. So let's give some examples, right? Um, uh, let's start with uh, matzah. Halachma. We talked about that, right? The, the gematria halachmania, or lachmania, anyway. It's 210, right? All right. Every... Uh, excuse me. So every... Uh, we have to remember... Why are we why are we eating why are we eating the bread now? Why are we eating not bread? Why are we eating matzah now? He says matzah has a dual identity. At the beginning of the Seder, we call it lachma anya, right? Bread of poverty. This it's tasteless, it's very simple. Uh, didn't we didn't have time to make it uh, ideal, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So in that sense, it's here to tell us that. The, the Hashem put details into the plan. In other words, every single detail serves a positive purpose. Both the redemption and the slavery played an equally crucial role in developing Klal Yisrael and furthering Hashem's plan for us. All right? So, in other words, the open your eyes, the matzah tells us. Pay attention to every detail you hear tonight. They are all important. They are all part of Hashem's plan to get the Jewish people where they needed to be and to get you where you need to be. Okay. Um, one moment. Okay. So, um, and we invite everybody to come, whoever is hungry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so he gives a, a great example of why it is that we invite people to the Seder in the middle of the Seder or at, at the beginning of the Seder, right? How do you identify yourself? Who do you identify, you identify yourself with? So sometimes the smallest little detail that you didn't think about yourself, you don't even consider usually, becomes super important. He gives an example of somebody who uh, who goes to a wedding in another country. Let's say you become, you're invited to a wedding in Israel. Your, your Hebrew is not so great yet, and uh, you're basically you feel totally lost. You don't know anybody, uh, and all of a sudden, a complete stranger comes up to you and says, "Excuse me, is this seat taken?" What do you notice? This person speaking English, and you finally found somebody else who speaks English. And even though you might be worlds apart completely different cultures, completely maybe different even countries, and nothing in common at all. That one little thing, the fact that you know how to speak English, now binds you to this person. It's a new, it's, it's a new thing. At the Seder, it's the same. For this one night, we're totally focused on being part of Kal Yisrael. We're all part of this Jewish people. The barriers that normally exist between us and so many of our other members of our nation temporarily fade, suddenly we're ready to welcome anybody, any needy Jew. Whether or not we understand their lifestyle, agree with their point of view, or mesh with their personality, they're all part of Klal Yisrael at the Seder. That's all that matters. Again, this consistent theme that the Seder is supposed to create this strong group called Klal Yisrael. And Klal Yisrael has a mission. Okay? Um, so... Let's skip to where it says Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah. Uh, I'm a Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah. Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah says, and then here it says that, uh, that that's where we get to like this whole halakhic discussion and uh, this uh, sort of Talmudic, this back and forth. 
What's going on here? Why is this here? So he says, um, he says, we need to live, we need to let this awareness, which awareness, hold on a second. Um, I, didn't, I didn't mark a good place to start here. Uh, people often find this uh, section, I'll read the whole thing. Why not? We've got time. Uh, people often find this section confusing. Sure, it mentions you see it in Mitzrayim, but it isn't a commentary on the story. It actually halachic discussion about a mitzvah totally separate from the Seder, the mitzvah of, to remember you see it in Mitzrayim every day of our lives. Uh, he says, I didn't know that, uh, that we're supposed to remember every day of our life until I saw this or that. So um, uh, why does this section belong here? Because it helps us realize how central Yitzhak Mitzrayim is to our lives. It reminds us that we're supposed to be living the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the story of our mission to bring Hashem's presence into the world every single day. Remember, that's, that's the goal, right? If that's the mission that we're supposed to have, every Jew has the mission to make Hashem's presence known to the world, that's how we're supposed to do it. This awareness needs to guide all the days of our lives, the days themselves when things are good, when we can sense Hashem's goodness, and the nights when His kindness is hidden. And we need to let the awareness, in other words, not literally day and night, but in other words, day and night, how clear it is that Hashem is guiding our lives. So even when it's not totally clear, even when life isn't what we would think is ideal, even then, we have to uh, keep in mind how Hashem takes care of us. And we need to let this awareness direct our every action, every re reaction, every decision, even once Mashiach comes. We need to live as Yitziat Mitzrayim Jews, Jews who, uh, Jews who center their lives around their mission. Again, that's, that's the important thing here. Then we start singing Baruch HaMakom Baruch Hu, or whatever tune you use. So... We're in the middle of telling the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, right? So why are we suddenly bursting into song about how grateful we are that Hashem gave us the Torah, which is what that song is about? Rashi tells us in Shemot 3, 11 to 3, 12, Hashem tells Moshe to go to Egypt and redeem the Jewish people. Moshe responds to the question, why? Klal Yisrael had fallen so low. How did they merit redemption? What's Hashem's answer? Klal Yisrael is destined to receive the Torah on Har Sinai. Why did Hashem create us, the Jewish people? Why did Hashem give birth to us as a nation through Yitzhak Mitzrayim? So we could fulfill creation's purpose. Again, revealing Hashem's presence in the world. That's our mission. That's why we're here. Klal Yisrael, me, you, to take this earthly world and make it godly. How do we do that? We don't need to guess or make things up. After freeing us from Egypt, Hashem gave us the Torah. Now, we have complete clarity on the extent of our mission to keep the Torah, to reveal Hashem's glory in this world by filling it with Torah, with mitzvot. Torah and mitzvot are the means by which we express Hashem's kavod in the world. When we do mitzvot, we fulfill Hashem's will, we acknowledge His kingship, we reveal His glory. If that's the mission, if that, the mission of a Jew is to make it clear to the world that there's a Hashem, there's only really one successful way to do that, and that's to keep the mitzvot and to keep the Torah that he gave us. That's why he did that. You know, we have lots of people nowadays who will say, you know, I think this is good, and this is what I'm going to do. I think, you know, um, stealing from the poor, stealing from the rich, giving to the poor, I think that's a good thing. Uh, or somebody who might say, I think uh, my country should be strong enough to conquer another country and take over their oil reserves. All right? And that's what's good. That's my definition of good. Who am I? Who are you? Who's anybody to tell them that they're wrong? Stealing from the rich and giving to the poor? That's very important. The poor need, need, uh, need the funds much more than the rich do. The rich have plenty. They don't need this, you know, this money. Comes along the Torah and says, uh-uh. You can't even be biased against the rich person in court, right? A rich person, a poor person have a dispute and you feel sorry for the poor person. You can't judge them anymore. You have to look at the letter of the law. If in the dispute, the poor person is in the wrong. So as ironic as this might sound and as useless as this money might be to the rich person, and it's very important as this money might be to the poor person, the poor person might have to pay a fine to the rich person. 
that's justice. That's fair. If the if the court decides on the the other way around, because that's for whatever reason that was that is the law, so the poor the rich man gives the poor person a fine, pays the poor pays the fine to the poor person. Justice is more important than your own biases. We can create all kinds of our own ideas of what's right, what's wrong, and we'll if we're not using the Torah, it's going to be wrong. Most of the time, right? So uh, wh whatever it is that you think is just, the world has all kinds of ideas in the last hundred years or so. We've seen all kinds of ideas of what people think is the right thing to do. I know nobody wants to, uh, nobody wants the extreme example. I think uh, these examples are good enough, but you, you have to remember that people who perpetuated the Holocaust also thought they were doing the right thing. They wanted to create peace in the world. To us, that sounds ridiculous. It's the opposite of peace. It's literally killing people, all kinds of people. But they thought getting rid of these people would create a, a society, would create the, you know, the opportunity for there to be a society that would uh, go on forever living in peace. If you don't have the Torah to anchor you, then you have no right to say that they're wrong. Right, so that is, is so again. So our goal, back to this, is the fact that we have a mission to show the world that there's a God. The only way to do that is to keep the Torah. So when we mention the Torah, it makes complete sense to start singing a song about it because that is what we're so happy about. We're happy that we have a Torah that we can fulfill our mission. Otherwise, our mission would be almost impossible. As it says in the Dayenu. Um, the, uh, each son gets an answer. We've talked about this before, right? We mentioned the, 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 the Russia, the evil son. Uh, let's talk about, for a second, let's talk about the wise son. The wise son also gets an answer. Right? He asks, uh, what, is, what, what is it that we're doing? And you answer him, you know, what, what we're doing is we're, where uh, you're supposed to teach him, he's wise, you can teach him the laws, the laws of the uh, Pesach. But in doing so, we make sure to emphasize one specific halacha, it says. Don't eat anything after Korban Pesach. Make sure that the afikomen, which used to have the Korban Pesach in it, it has that taste throughout the night. That's what you're going to, that's the last thing you're going to eat. Let that taste of Yitzhak Mitzrayim linger in your mouth. Why? What we're saying is yes, wise son. It's critical to focus on the technical details, all the laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's important to make sure you're always gaining new knowledge. True, true. You're at Sadiq. Very good. But don't let your Judaism stay intellectual. Don't lose the forest for the trees. Make sure that you're letting in the tam, the taste of the Seder as well, that you're leaving room for its message to touch you and change you. When you learn to do that, you'll be able to approach your mission with genuine devotion. Back to your mission. Even the, even the tzaddik has a mission. Right? The, uh, the son who doesn't know how to ask. Right? Why isn't he asking anything? You know why he's not asking anything? Says this book, because he's tuned out. He isn't interested in the Seder. He's a practical sort of guy, focused on the present and in the future. Doesn't see why this history lesson is relevant to him. You know, those people who don't want to learn history, because you know, what's the point? I uh, just want to know what's going on. So what's our task here? To show him why it's relevant. History is relevant. You don't understand the present without knowing the past. We're not living in a bubble. To help him understand that we're only, we're only referencing the past so we can live a better present, that we're not just sitting around commemorating some old story, we're arming ourselves with the tools to take out our own places. Sorry, we're arming ourselves with the tools to take our own places in that story. See for son. Hashem didn't just free our people so we could live the easy life. He redeemed us 
for this reason, so we could fulfill our mission. Again, this Ba'avur Zeh is a very important part of this entire book. For this reason, the whole Seder is Ba'avur Zeh. For this, for us to fulfill our mission. So we could accept his Torah and bring and start bringing his presence into the world. You didn't have to, you didn't have anything to ask for, son. You didn't find the Seder relevant. Why? Because you didn't know about your mission. Now you know, and you're ready to start incorporating it into your life. Beautiful idea. Um, I'm just going to skip around a little bit. Um, ah, then we start at Say Omad, the, the interpretation of the verses that we say at the Bikurim um, offerings are interpreted having to do with Arami Ovid Avi, the, the, all these different uh, ideas about um, about uh, how the Jewish people were led into Egypt. And we learn it out from the verses that have to do with the Bikurim. Now, what are Bikurim? Bikurim were uh, first fruit offerings that were brought to Yerushalayim by the farmers of Israel. And they had the whole like a whole list of things they have to say. And those verses that the Torah tells us that these farmers should say are now being said uh, by us and interpreted to have to do it with the Seder. So he writes, once upon a time when the Beit HaMikdash stood, Israel's farmers used to journey from all across the land to donate Bikurim, the first fruits of their harvest, to the Holy Temple. Part of the donation ceremony included a short thank you prayer. This prayer contained four verses, four psukim describing the Exodus. The first one speaks about going down to Mitzrayim and going into a nation. The second details the cruelty the Egyptians treated us with. Wow. The third talks about how Hashem heard our cries for salvation. The fourth describes that salvation. Why did Hashem decide to feature Yitziat Mitzrayim in this thank you prayer for successful harvest? What does Yitziat Mitzrayim and harvest have to do with each other? To remind the farmers that everything they had, their farm in Eretz Yisrael, their plentiful crop, their prosperity, their freedom, was only because of Yitziat Mitzrayim. You only have this because you were taken out of Egypt. Only because of this mission that they were part of. Only to enable them to fulfill their mission. All of what you have. All of your wealth. All of your success. Where you are. Who you are. Who your friends are. Everything you have is all about your mission. When our sages composed the Haggadah, they took these four psukim, added some commentary, and made this our core script for retelling the Seder story. Why? because they wanted us to approach the story with the same attitude as the Bikurim farmers, as our story. The reason we're here, the reason we have all that we do. They wanted us to think we're here today because Hashem charged us with a mission to bring his presence into the world on the Seder night, telling the story of how it all began, help us reorient ourselves so we can keep living this story, living our mission every day. Beautiful. Um, towards the end of, uh, of this section of the Bikurim, we get into uh, the we get into the ten plagues. And right before that, it's a very interesting line. We need Sak El Hashem Elakai of So we cried out to Hashem, the God of our forefathers. Elokai Avatin. And uh, I, I like how he writes this. It's, it's very beautiful. Because you, you read this and you think to yourself, Hashem was torturing us and hurting us just so we, just, just so we could hear our prayers. He knew how bad things were. Why, why is he doing that? So he answers that question very nicely. And it's a great question to bring up at, the, at your Seder. If nobody, if nobody already brings it up, it's a great question to bring up. It wasn't like Hashem hadn't been paying attention until we cried out to him. As much as we yearn, yearned to be free, Hashem yearned to redeem us. But we had to be the ones to start the process. We needed to reach out to him through tefillah. Why? 
because his goal in redeeming us was to make us his special people. This Klalis role, this mission idea, to entrust his mission to us. That's what he had promised the Avot, who had ta- the four, our forefathers, who had taken that mission on for themselves. But were we, their descendants, still on board with the mission? Hashem wanted to determine that with complete clarity. So he plunged us into the agony of Egypt. He squeezed, squeezed, squeezed until the pain was unbearable. Our response, what did we do in response? We dove into him. If at our core we didn't completely identify with our forefathers' mission and live with the Muna in Hashem's plan to help us fulfill it, the slavery and torture would have got, would have broken us like it did the four-fifths of the Jewish people. We would have given up, cursed Hashem, lost all belief in our special identity. But we didn't. Our ancestors didn't. Deep, deep inside, we were still his children, still connected to him, still fully confident in the fact that Hashem would rescue us from Egypt so we could fulfill our mission. It wasn't that Hashem heard us crying and rescued us of, out of pity. He heard our imuna. When we cried to him, he heard our faith. He heard that our avot, the heritage of our avot, was still alive within us. And he knew that by redeeming us, he could really fulfill his promise to them. We were truly fit to become the Am Hashem, his eternal torchbearers. And of course, the book goes on. I'm, I'm just uh, skimming through different pages. Uh, there's... I mean, really a great little booklet. I highly recommend it. It's free, for goodness sake. Uh, there's uh, 42 pages in it. And we, we've, uh, in this class, we've gone through about 30 of them. But there's uh, a lot more that I've skipped and a lot more even afterwards. But again, the point is that the whole idea of the Seder is a mission statement, right? It's very important. Uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in, in, in the world of, uh, of uh, nonprofit organizations, not-for-profit organizations, uh, one of the most important things is to have a mission, to have a goal. What is it that you want from this organization? What, what's, what's, what's the end game? And once you know what that is, then you can work backwards. How do we accomplish that goal? If you don't have a goal, you're just kind of floundering around. So if you have a goal, you know how to get there. And the Haggadah tells you what your goal is, and the Haggadah tells you how to get there. So at the end of the Haggadah, by the time you get to Nirza, you will be inspired to live a Jewish life. That's the idea. That's, what's, that's, what, uh, it's, that's what our, our ancestors and our sages have wanted for us all along, for each Seder to do is to build and, and strengthen our Judaism and, and our commitment to our mission. On that topic, I just wanted, like I said, uh, I, I I know it's uh, it's getting late, so I'll just say one quick word from Rav Chaim Kanievsky. Uh, the the Dayenu, right, right, the very very end of the Magid section before benching, before the singing, and all, everything else. So the very very end there is is Dayenu, and what do we say in Dayenu? We say Hashem did this amazing miracle, and if He would have just done that, that would have been enough. And then he goes on to the next miracle. We say the next miracle he did. He took, a, he took our ancestors, he took our people, our fathers out of Egypt. They, that would have been enough. He, uh, for, you know, he, he, he fed them in the desert for 40 years. That would have been enough. He gave them Shabbos. That would have been enough. He gave them the Torah. That would have been. So we go on and on and on. He gave us, uh, he took us to Harsin. I'm, t- I'm saying these out of order. What's, what would have been enough? What does that mean, Dayenu? It would, it would have been enough for what? You know what Rav Chaim Kanievsky says? Such a, such a simple idea. But it's, this might change your Seder. This one quick idea. You know what it, it would have been enough for? It would have been enough to have a Seder. Just for that thing. That one thing. The fact that Hashem took your ancestors out of Egypt is enough of a reason to celebrate every single year. Have a a big meal and uh, sing songs and be thankful to Hashem just for that one thing. Hashem fed our ancestors in the desert for 40 years. Miraculously. That's reason enough to have a Seder all by itself. Dayenu, that would have been enough. 
But that wasn't enough for Hashem. He also gave them the Torah. He also took them to Har Sinai. Again, I'm saying it out of order. Right? Just any one of those things would have been a good enough reason to have a Seder, to have a celebration. And yet Hashem just keeps piling it on, piling it on, piling it on, because he wants to show us how much he loves us. As we say, at, at, after the Dayenu song, we have a whole paragraph which we read, Hashem did this, and Hashem did that, and he did this, and he, all of these reasons. All of these reasons to have a Seder. Individually. And yet we have just one Seder that commemorates all of them. It's not enough. We're not doing enough. We could be doing so much more. What a lesson. What a lesson. Uh, it's... Uh, it's really a beautiful thing to have the opportunity to share some insights in the Haggadah. I'm glad, uh, I'm very happy that you're, you're here to listen, but I, I also want to encourage you uh, as much as you can to try to hear other insights, to really get into the mood of the Haggadah while you're doing whatever else you're doing. There's a lot of, there's a lot of Torah out there, Torah anytime and uh, 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 OUtorah.org, uh, you know, YU Torah. Uh, H. Lots, sorry, H. H. Thank you, thank you, H. Uh, a lot, there's a lot of opportunities to to listen to other inspirational things, uh, and uh, it, I, I encourage you to avail yourselves of these things because the this is a very special moment you have. You have a great opportunity at, at your seder to inspire yourself and your family, and uh, and your and your guests, your neighbors, whoever else. Uh, the, the the needy that you've invited to your seder or whoever else, this is your opportunity to inspire everybody to live a very beautiful, meaningful life uh, dedicated to the mission that Hashem has given us. I I, I hope these classes with the we talked about the we talked about we have basically four classes just this year alone and at least four classes from last year uh, on on YouTube if you want to listen to those. Uh, I, I hope they have helped you. To uh, to elevate your Pesach in some way, and to uh, really to to create a stronger sense of our purpose in being Hashem's people. Uh, enjoy your holiday. Chag kasher v'sameach. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>